Hi gems. <laughs> Welcome back to my channel. Um, today is different for me. Um, if you guys have been following me on social media for this long, I see that we've grown quite a bit and I haven't really put out much content. Um, and I'm going to be honest, this is very um, spur of the moment recording this because um, I don't know if there's many believers that follow me. I am a Christian woman and um, my faith is in uh, God and what he's done for my life and how he has got me out of really, really bad, uh, tough situations, raising my boys, being a young parent, like so many things. Like my faith really lies in my, um, in my relationship with God. And for the past month, I have not slept um, consistently throughout the night. And I finally come to a place where, um, I know it's because, sorry. So, um, it really comes to the conclusion that God is disrupting my sleep because I have yet to tell my story. And you guys would be like, story, everyone she's talking about. Uh, I, I want to take full responsibility in the fact that I do present myself very poised and pulled together. I mean, there's these moments where you guys are like, hmm, Amber's a little different, uh, but really can't put your finger on it. And I haven't alluded to anything. Um, again, let me just give you some background. I am now in Baltimore, Maryland. Me and the boys are back home uh, in the city that I was raised in. Um, and we're thriving and 2020 has been a shit show. And I just feel like I don't want to go into 2021 kind of, um, still holding on and feeling hostage to my situation. Um, I have a really, really amazing, uh, village foundation, um, support system, whether it be my girls and beauty, whether it be my best friends, my sister, as you guys have come to learn and know. If you guys are following me on Instagram, um, she's the most amazing individual in the world. Uh, but it's about time that I share my story because I know for a fact that it can help someone who was in my situation immensely. So I'm nervous and I don't know why I'm nervous because I'm never nervous when I'm talking to you guys. I'm never nervous recording. It's just very natural to me. Um, it's something that I've always enjoyed doing. The boys are with my mother right now. So I have this free space to kind of just release without any interruption um, and really just um, start from the beginning. So I started YouTube in 2000 and. 16. No, I'm lying. 2013. Um, initially because I was a black girl who moved from Baltimore to Seattle, Washington, and I didn't know who was going to do my locks. I didn't know who was going to do my brows. I didn't know who was going to do my nails. And I decided to venture out on my own and learn how to maintain myself in the midst of being a single parent of, at the time, Reese was eight and Pierce was one and a half. Um, and it was, it was such a transition, but an exciting adventure nonetheless. Me and the kid's father had broken up and I took this opportunity to get this position in this corporate space as an opportunity to really reset and kind of start fresh. But that doesn't mean that I didn't leave that relationship broken, insecure, um, not really addressing the, the issues that I contributed to the relationship. And this isn't to talk about the kid's dad because at the end of the day, even though everyone has their stuff, he's a good person and I know he loves my boys. Um, our relationship aside, I couldn't ask for a better father for them um, emotionally. Um, so th that actually has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> but um, I moved to Washington feeling very lonely. I don't know if there's Libras out there. We have a really hard time being alone. Um, I always found validation in my friendships or validation, um, in my relationships romantically. Um, I just didn't feel like I liked or enjoyed myself enough. It's hard to say this to be by myself, to enjoy truly being by myself. I'd been in a relationship with the kid's father for 11 years prior to moving. And that was, we had like maybe a two year breakup. Um, where we pursued other relationships, but still brought it back together. So I'd been in a relationship from the age of 16 to 19 when I met the kid's father, the 19 to 30, right? And then I had moved across the country with my babies. 
So I, there was never any time that I had been by myself. I'd always been the girl in a long-term monogamous relationship. And I, I, I still love that about myself. I am not, uh, you know, have a different dude every six or eight months. I stuck with one person and I think that has a lot to do with, this is therapy now. I think that had a lot to do with seeing my parents. They've been together 43 years, married 38. And I never saw my mother leave, uh, even though there's been things in their relationship that um, was unbeknownst to me because I was younger and my sister protected me and covered me and really held a lot of things from, from me being able to kind of be in the mix of any kind of toxic relationships. So in my world, I lived in the Huxtable residence, okay? My parents worked, they loved each other, we went to church, I had extracurricular activities, I went to private school, then they sent me to a um, magnet school, one of the, a very prestigious one in Baltimore. Um, sis went to college uh, after the military. Like she had a path. She followed the path. She didn't have no babies in high school, you know. So I really had blinders on any hardships uh, from a relationship to refer to. So for me, a toxic relationship was like this new concept of like, what? What are you talking about? So moving to Washington. I gave myself a year after that separation from the kid's father and I met my ex who you guys have seen on my platform before and retrospect is a mofo okay because if I really were to sit and think about it which I have a million and two thousand times um I feel like I drew that type of partner I drew a man who knew I was a good woman, who knew that I was a single parent, that felt insecure, and he um, saw that as an opportunity to acquire uh, me in that way. And now I have to take responsibility too. I just wanted to fill the void of being alone. I didn't think anyone would want to be with me, a single parent of two small kids, my luggage, my baggage. Again, my own insecurities, never being alone, um, wanting to create the structure and foundation that I couldn't with the children's father for them because that's what I had. I had a two parent household. I had a sister. I had a cat. I have a dog, but we had the, what would, what would be, I guess like the textbook or fairy tale idea of what a family unit looked like. So I wanted to create that for my kids. I always used to joke like, I just want the original members of Destiny's Child. <laughs> you know, like I want my kids, I want them to see mom being loved and creating a foundation and structure in a home. So um, with that said, I met my ex in September of 2013. And if I'm looking down, it's because I kind of had to make notes. A lot of things that um, I forgot about came out in therapy, having conversations with my sister. And I think it's important for context for you to understand the timeline because there are women who are in this situation. Now, I'm not trying to alarm you. I just want to provide all the context so that you can see where like, ooh, you could do things different, how I could have done things different. So needless to say, that's why I'm going about it that way. But I met my ex online. Um, an old coworker of mine felt like, all right, Amber, it's time for you today. And she created a profile. She stole my pictures from my Facebook page and like decided to facilitate the connecting, right? So she created me a profile on Plenty of Fish. I don't even know. I, I can't get sued, right? <laughs> I ain't that big. So um, I met him on Plenty of Fish and he had DM'd. And she felt like she did her due diligence to kind of do some recon um, before submitting him to me as a potential dating candidate, right? I thought he was attractive. I thought he was charming. I thought we had a lot in common because he was also an East Coaster. And I had always, coincidentally enough, dated men from New York. Um, my children's father's from New York and my ex was from New York. And I just felt um, a sense of uh, familiarity and like home in that space. Just listen, if you're from the East Coast, you know, like men from the West Coast are different and there's nothing wrong with that. They're just different. So to me, it felt comfortable. Um, and we met in 2013, that September. Um, and I'm not going to lie. Uh, like I mentioned before, something that came out of therapy is that when I met him, um, from the moment I met him, I was anxious. Um, I had you know, something in the pit of my stomach that was kind of like, mm. but I thought it was butterflies, girl. You know, I thought it was love and I'm a hopeless romantic and um, look how God has given someone in my life that is going to come in and swoop and like save me and my children from 
being out here trying to figure out life. Now, mind you, I was making six figures. I had our own home. I had a car. I didn't need saving, essentially. That's why I've never been the girl to date, like, the, um the corner boy or the, or the drug dealer type or the street dude because my mother in, in Baltimore, you either go right or you go left. And my mother, Sister Patterson, as you all may know her, really was on us, like white on rice. Like my girls will not become um, subject of their environment, a product of their environment. So um, in that regard, um, I never dated men for money. I never dated them for status. But at the time, he was in the military. So, look, he's coming to the table. He's self-sufficient. He know how to pay a bill and has a bank account. Okay? He know how to write a check. <laughs> so, um, with that said, I felt like, wow, look at this. We immediately clicked. I mean, it was like, it was like just this surge of energy and we just clung to each other. Um, and that is what I'm learning now to be the beginning of a very codependent relationship, a very unhealthy codependent relationship. Um, a little tidbit, when you're dating a man, it is important that they have friends. It's important that they have an outlet, um, a sounding board outside of your relationship because you can't be everything for someone. I learned later that, you know, you should be the Sunday and your partner should be the cherry on top. And in that particular time of my life, I made him my Sunday. Um, and because I thought I had this second chance at this, this formed structure. So within the first month of dating, I get a phone call at work where he's like, I have something to tell you. Um, I just feel like it's something we need to just immediately get out of the way, uh, before we really commit. Cause we had probably dated for a week before I was like, you mind the end, close down shop, let all the girls know. And he uh, confirmed like he was on board with that. Um, but within the first month of us dating, he called me and told me that he had slept with his ex-girlfriend. Now, at this time, that's red flag number one. <laughs> that within the first month of committing committing yourself to me um, and, a, and being exclusive with me, you still have some leftover baggage and mass with another female. And you know, he, I think you're amazing. I really want to make this work. Um, I just wanted to be honest. She came over. And one thing led to another, that whole bull crap. And me being the benefit of the doubt type of woman um, was, you know, you don't know, you don't know how to love. I can teach you how to love. You're just sabotaging a good thing because you're scared. This is me making excuses for a man who literally slept with someone else um, within the first month of us being exclusive. So we, we work through that. Um, and this particular female will come back up later. So this is 2013. Um, we decide we want to move forward. We want to, um, you know, build something together. And sis, I, at the time was living about 45, 50 minutes away from him. And at that time I felt like I was driving to see him every two or three days on my days off of work. At the time, my niece Jordan was living with us, so she was of age to watch the boys for me when I was gone for a day or two overnight. Like, what are you What are you thinking? I'm not going to beat myself up. I've, it's taken me two years to share this with you guys. <laughs> so um, he had said, look, we just need to move in together. Like, it's cheaper down here. You're paying an exorbitant cost living in Seattle. Um, you should just come down here and we can just kind of build something together, split bills, all that other stuff. Um, at that time, I didn't even see how he was manipulating me um, to come in and be of really less than a financial burden for him, let alone me. Um, but I saw it very twisted and confused, and I moved. Again, timeline. I met him September of 2013 with two small children, and I moved in with this man 60 days later. I am so embarrassed. <laughs> I'm smiling because I'm embarrassed. Um, and it's helping me not cry because I wasn't a kid, right? I wasn't in my twenties. I was 30 years old and was swept up in this, this, this idea and this concept, this love affair rather. So we moved in together and, um, yeah, within 60 days of knowing each other after he told me that he already slept with someone the first month we were together. Um, in November of 2013, right? He proposed to me. 
Um, and I did allude that my niece was living with me. And he proposed to me because those who have been in military situations, he was about to PCS, which is relocate to another city, and did not want to lose me. Did not want to lose um, the love of his life. But really, he did not want to lose the benefits that the military give you when you marry someone. Okay? Um, and I coincidentally, oh my God, yes, right? I say I do. And he gives me a ring. And I move, I send my, my niece back to Baltimore. Um, it created qu quite the contention between me and my sister. We have never not spoken for more than 24, 40 odd hours after a fight. And I think this is probably like the longest maybe month that we didn't speak and it was awful. I had essentially chose a man over my niece, over better judgment, essentially over my kids, if I'm gonna be completely honest. Um, and that breaks my heart because you guys know how I feel about my babies. Um, and had I known what I know now, I would have never put them in that situation. Um, I'm not crying over this man. I'm crying because I gave these babies life. I raised them. And I just wasn't within clear mind. So at this point, you know, the enemy was talking to me. Amber, he's a good man. Your children will have a positive role model. Um, I have my cousin over my shoulder because she is 100% giving me strength right now. Um, anyway, let's keep it pushing. <laughs> so that was... Um, that was 2013, essentially, the, the bottom half of 2013. Girl, I'm trying not to be Candace on Real Housewives of Atlanta. <laughs> you got to be like, so you're going to see an ugly cry. Sorry. Ooh, I got myself together. My sister called me really quick. So 2013, we moved in. We're engaged. All I asked was that we could be engaged for a year before we got married. Um, so we got engaged 2013. We go in 2014. Um, and we had, uh, moved from an apartment to a rental property because hear me out. Um, he got a phone call from the military that said he cannot live. <laughs> Mind you, we're engaged. He cannot live with me and the boys anymore because of some secret clearance situation. Girl, I was really on, I was smoking the crack because that'd make no sense. He ended up getting an apartment right down the street from where I had rented this single family home. Um, and I knew something was fishy, bro. Like I knew something was up. I used to be that girl who drove and saw if there were cars in the parking lot. And I saw the girl's car in his parking lot before. Um, he had claimed that he was going to be going away and he had to have a secret location. He had to have a secret, not a secret, but he had to have a separate living space from his fam. Girl, girl. And I believed it. I believed it. Um, six months into his lease, though, he claimed that um, the military no longer want, were going to pursue him in that advancement. Mind you, because I'm a civilian. I don't know anything. Like, I was in the military, but as a reservist, and I got hurt, so I was honorably discharged. So I never really was integrated in, like, the lifestyle. I only kind of knew people get married at 19 and divorced by 25. Like, I really didn't, and had a, mil uh, had a bunch of babies. Like, I really didn't know um, all the things that he was talking about because... He was, um, not special forces. Was he special? Not special force. Um, I can't remember. Whatever. So six months after him moving into his own apartment and me going into the single family house with the kids, he decided that, um, once he had found out from the military that he was no longer pursuing this path to rent out his apartment to another guy so that he didn't break his lease and he moved into the house with me and the boys. So we're living, this is the house we moved into before we bought a home. And, um, my best friend Ed and Sebastian lived with us there for a couple months before they left Seattle. They're the kids' uncles, gunkles. <laughs> and, um, a lot of toxic behavior started in that home. It started with the way we ate. He controlled that. It started with the time we woke up in the morning. It controlled that. And me trying to aim for perfection, I made sure his breakfast and his lunch and his dinner. Now, mind you, I'm just doing what I saw my mother do, right? As the, as, the, as the head of the household, the woman of the household, these are the things that we would be honored to do because this man is taking care of things. He's the leader of our household. 
Um, he's, he's a provider for our household. Um, so I was just doing what I saw. I saw my mother be that type of woman and wife to my dad. So this is my, this is my soon to be husband. So be it. There were arguments in that home that my children were exposed to. Um, they were name calling. Um, one time I was on my computer and I was like, oh, me and so-and-so are going to go, um, to happy hour after work on Friday. And this is the moment that I realized that he was isolating me from my friends. Um, well, I really want you home with me. I really want to spend time with you. I really want to, because he was really projecting his insecurities. I live, when we bought this house together, we lived about 50 minutes from Seattle. So he just knew in Seattle, I had a whole nother life, girl. I had a man up there. I was sleeping with people. I was you know, just living the life. So any time that I would spend additional time in the city um, would really trigger his insecurities. So I'm on my computer and I kind of shrugged like, well, I kind of already made the plans. Girl, he jumped across the bedroom, grabbed my neck and slammed me to the floor. Um, I was shocked. I was um, shook. <laughs> I was... Uh, I was confused. I felt like, how, how, did he, what, like all those things. So I, all I did remember doing was like screaming, get off of me. I grabbed my keys, ran out the house and went to the Starbucks down the road and just cried and bawled. Mind you, my children are in the home. So I didn't even consider my babies. Like, I mean, I didn't even consider my babies. Like what if he had harmed my children? What if he, what if he, would have done something terrible to them in spite of me. He was calling me. He was blowing my phone up. I didn't know if like I should, like I've never been in an abusive relationship. So I didn't know um, if this was just like a one time thing. Did he like, was he stressed that, that like I trigger something that happened from his tours <laughs> in Afghanistan? Like, I, I don't know if there was like a sudden movement that my shrug or I, I don't know what it was. Needless to say, he called me, he apologized, we worked through it, never happened again, right? So we think. Um, so that was 2014. All the while, um, I found receipts in his pockets from a hotel stay. Um, he told me that him and his military friends rented a hotel room to talk work on the weekend. He was fucking other bitches. Like, let's just keep it 100. Um, this is again in retrospect. This is me not knowing. Oh my God, I could totally see how you could think that, Amber. I promise you it wasn't that at all. I mean, because I did his laundry. I'm washing his uniforms every week. Um, and I saw this hotel, this hotel receipt. So, you know, women, we, we really have a built-in device, okay? We really, really, really um, know when shit ain't smelling right. We just, we know it, but we deny ourselves the reality of it because we don't want to lose something or we don't want to deal with the reality of it. Um, if anything, it's, it's definitely had me think about, um, you know, when those basketball wives or football wives go back to their husbands, like you never know what people are going through and you never know what you do in that situation. So, um, once he blatantly lied to me and I'm like, okay, whatever. The next day I ended up calling the hotel and was like, oh my gosh, I left um, I left something in the room. I can't remember what I said, but uh, I was on some investigative, you know, mission. Um, and, and she ended up telling me, um, oh, well, you didn't have a hat on that day. You had, um, you had in like, didn't you have twist in your hair or something like that? So I'm like, wow, I never had worn braids because I was bald. <laughs> 2013 to 2015, I had a one. I had a regular. So when she described what she thought I was wearing, I knew that it was another woman with him. And he denied it. And I never brought it up because I never brought it up again because I just wanted peace. I wanted peace. I wanted calmness. I wanted this foundation, this structure for my kids. And, um, I didn't want to ruffle any feathers, especially because I'm 3000 miles away from anyone I know, family or friends. I'm raising these boys by myself, but also trying to pursue my career goals, but living with severe anxiety. When I say severe anxiety, songs to this day trigger me. 
um, when, when I'm looking at my phone and it's hours in between our conversations because on the military base, I don't have a good signal. Um, yes and no, yes and no, but mostly no. <laughs> uh, my whole relationship was anxious from the beginning, from the moment he told me he cheated on me within the first month of us being together, I never lived without anxiety. Um, but I had no idea what that was at the time until I started going to therapy, which is much many more years after we were initially met. So where are we now? Um, I found the hotel receipt. Um, we're going through 2014. We're traveling. We are, um, you know, supporting his transition from the military to civilian sector. Um, we were fighting whether or not we were supposed to be moving to Oklahoma, not moving to Oklahoma, him going to Japan. Like it was a lot. It was a military life for 2014. Um, However, in, I want to say December of, November, December of 2014, um, he left his email. Cause you know how, uh, um, like iPhone has keychains. iPhone? <laughs> Max. That's what it is. Max. They have keychains. So they save your passwords and your logins and, unless you sign yourself out or clean out your cookies or cache or incognito I, I don't know I'm not really into that but I saw he got an email um receipt from REI which is like an outdoor wholesaler um in the Pacific Northwest and it was like a jacket rain jacket and some other like apparel things and I saw that it was being shipped to an address that we surely don't live at and I saw the name of the person who he was sending gifts to. And it was the girl that he cheated on me with in 2013. So I immediately called Sebastian, who's my gay best friend. <laughs> and um, I'm crying to him on the phone. I'm screaming, I'm yelling. And, you know, he walks me through it. And um, I did what any normal, rational, insecure woman would do. And I canceled the order. <laughs> I canceled the order. I printed out the receipt and we had to sit down. Um, girl, I was so nervous. I was so anxious about this because I had been fighting him for at this part, a year and a half of our relationship about leaving this bitch behind. Like, why is she so significant to you that you can't be in a relationship, um, a healthy, <laughs> consistent relationship with me that you still have to be, this, this, she's still a, 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 like, why do I know her name? Why do I know her like she exists? How does she feel so comfortable? Because me and her had definitely gotten into a verbal confrontation um, the year before, verbal, I mean, over the phone. Um, and then her mother got involved. He was so drunk and she was calling him and I answered the phone and I was like, what the hell is going on? Like, why? I mean, who does that? I'm not fighting bitches for no man. But at the time I did, I ain't gonna lie. So she has always been on the tip of our tongue and it was just driving me crazy. So I took a couple shots of Patron and I said, listen, you have a choice. We either choose me and the kids or you choose her because I don't give a hell what she did for you when you were overseas. I don't care what letters she didn't wrote. <laughs> I don't care. Like this is your, this is your now. So either you choose us or you choose her. Um, let's make sure my mic is on. Um, and he claimed that he chose us. So we went into 2000. I said, I'm not going into another year with this bullshit. So we went into 2015 um, with the clean slate. All of this is toxic behavior. All of this should have been deaded day one. All of this should not have been my life, um, essentially. But I'm going to be honest with you. I stayed because I was alone alone I stayed because I was scared to raise children alone I was scared um to live uh, a life um where I had to get to know and love me by myself and that is the god honest truth um I didn't want to be alone I didn't want I did I didn't want to be alone I didn't want to be alone I had no friends I had co-worker friends but I had no, I, I didn't have nearly the relationships that I have with people back in Seattle like I do now. Um, and I, and I really wanted to make it work. Um, I didn't want to be like, wow, another relationship failed, especially after giving 11 years of my life to someone else with the kids. So we go into 2015 stronger, better than ever. 
And one day I get a phone call in March. No, I'm lying. May? The end of May. And he's like, babe, let's get married. I'm like, what? I was like, huh? I mean, I don't have a dress. I don't have da 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 I said, please give me some time. Like, I need to gather myself. I mean, at the end of the day, Amber is still very much a girly girl. <laughs> and I needed to get my look together. So uh, what we ended up doing is registering for our licenses in 2015. And we got married June 5th of 2015. Um, his friends were our witnesses. We had an officiant and we overlooked the Puget Sound. It was beautiful and it was special and it was sweet. And I didn't tell my parents until after we were married. Um, and that was hard because I come from a very, very, very close family. Um, but I felt because we had so many miles apart, no one could make me second guess or, um, you know, feel, uh, like, like their judgment could influence my decision. Um, so we got married. Uh, within the same week of us getting married, we found our house and started the buying process. F fell in love, got married, bought a house. Um, my kids appeared to be happy. Um, at this point, Pierce uh, only knew him and not his father. I mean, he. Let me let me backtrack. I never once denied my kids access to their father. Um, but he wasn't their dad and that's a significant difference. My ex was their dad. They're every day. They're constant. They're at, you know, sport, sporting events, him financially supporting them. So Pierce at the age of three would be like, oh, but he's my father and he's my dad. Like he could identify the difference between the two. I always made sure there were pictures of their father in their bedrooms. Um, every summer I sent the kids back to Baltimore to make sure that they could have the summer with their father. Um, so I was like the ideal baby mother in the sense, like later he thanks me for it, but you know, there's, there's roads to get through to get on the other side of things. You know, when people see past themselves and, 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 and reach a peak of maturity, but my kids knew who their father was period. And Reese had a very strong relationship with his father because he was eight at this point. He knows who this man is versus, you know, Pierce being so young. So I fast forward, um, to us buying the house, moving in, having our first Christmas, girl, having our first Christmas, um, integrating his children into our life. Um, I met his daughter when she was six months old. And this is also another, uh, another back story of context. I never met, I never met my stepdaughter's mother in person. Um, and she was in my life from the age of six months to six years old. Now here's the thing. You could look at that situation and think, wow, um, she, maybe she's just bitter. Maybe she doesn't want to see the reality of him in um, a healthy, f strong relationship, married. Like, she knew I was his wife, and she knew that when her daughter would come over on our weekends that clearly a woman was taking care of her because I was doing hair, and come on. Like, women, we know, we know. But later finding out that he was just trying to still tap dance with the baby mother. Um, and she didn't want to meet me because, not because she probably didn't want to, but because he was creating space so that we would never um, communicate uh, to potentially put storylines together, right? Start connecting some dots where there's some disconnect. Um, and I believed him. I believed that she was just bitter. I believed that she just was evil and angry and just, you know, pinned us against each other. Right. Um, that particular summer, uh, his son came and stayed with us. Um, and later, oh my gosh, you guys, it's so much. I feel like this is going to be so long, but later, um, found out that the only reason why his son came is because the mother trusted me, not him. And, uh, we just proceeded to live our life. Um, he exited the military in 2015, 2016 was probably the, uh, the worst year of, of our relation. I mean, all, everything was terrible, but <laughs> 2016 to 2017 was probably the worst year of our relationship. There was some, um, psychological breakdowns. There were some, um, continued abuse. There were name calling. There was um, a lot of disrespect. There were physical altercations. There were head buttings. I remember being six weeks pregnant and he flipped our bed on top of my head because he was just so frustrated that I was holding him accountable for his behavior. Working all day long, because that's another thing. I worked and commuted. I worked 
eight or nine hours a day. I commuted 20 hours a week and I would come home and still have to cook dinner every night. He never once took any of that workload off of me um, to be a true partner. He just sat. And I don't know if this is like a cultural thing, like Caribbean men, um, Caribbean is probably, that's more correct. The Caribbean men are just are coddled by their mothers and just expect to be served at all times, really not having a true partnership. So I'd be exhausted. I'm busting my ass at work. I'm trying to be a good mom and a good wife. And he was just antagonizing, antagonizing. I'm, I'm, I, I'm so pissed. I like wiped the table. Cause you know, this is after all the other abuse that was going on and a knife flew across. And at that moment, Pierce had came up the steps and it hit his foot. And I thought, wow, my stress and anxiety and, and angst um, caused me to hurt my child. Like it cut the tip of his toe, a knife, because this man had been pushing and pushing and pushing. And you know what he did? He laughed. So at that moment, I knew that he was just, he just basked and me being in pain and me being angry and me and him just perpetuating chaos later to come out because that's what he is accustomed to in his household. I never saw my parents argue. I never saw my father yell. I never saw my father raise a hand to my mother. Not to say this, these things didn't happen. I don't know, but I, in my upbringing, I never saw aggression in my household. Um, so I had not been accustomed to any kind of aggressive behavior in my household growing up. Later to find out he um, did. And I can see that was his representation of what he felt a marriage or a relationship or a household would look like. Chaotic, toxic, um, scary. So I remember one time he was like, yeah, right, 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 right. I'm like, oh, babe, give me a second. I'm cooking some something on the stove and it, I think I was making chicken. So you got the, the grease popping, the kids in the living room watching TV, the dog walking around, couldn't hear me. Like, you don't hear me calling you. I'm like, well, I can't hear you with a very like live buzzing. Why don't you just come into the kitchen with me? Like I'm, I'm so whatever. Who the f you think you talking to? What? Like it was insane. He got this close to my face and then he head butted me in front of my children. And again, I was like, Oh, like, Wow, like when he just gets to a point of frustration and contention, he just doesn't know how to process anything out of physical, um, a physical outlet. Um, I yell for my children to go downstairs. Mind you, Reese is well aware that this is not the behavior that anybody should have. Um, Pierce is little, so it was kind of easier for his brother to kind of come on Pierce and do what my sister essentially did for me growing up. Um... I ended up sleeping downstairs in my kid's room that night. Um, he never, wow, he never, he, he never had remorse. Um, there were times I would take a shower and he would come in the shower knowing that we had just had a big argument just to be like, well, I need to take a shower just to invade my space, just to bully me. Um, I was a bitch. I was stupid. I was an idiot. I couldn't do nothing right. Technically, I'm not his wife because I haven't given him a child. Context. In that relationship, I had seven miscarriages. I had seven miscarriages. I just thought if I could just give him a kid. He would stop. He would, he would want to, um, I dealt with every one of those mystic carriages by myself. Um, he never went to the ER with me. He said he hated hospitals. He FaceTimed me and he was at a sushi restaurant while I was in the ER with IVs in my arm and tubes up my home girl to make sure that if I the miscarriage wasn't didn't require a DNC. I had a miscarriage 
on a holiday vacation and he left he left me in the hospital um I later found out the day that one of our babies died um via miscarriage I don't want to allude that I went full term but I was probably 10 weeks and we lost this that particular child and the same day he wrote an email to believe it or not the same woman he cheated on me with the first month that we were together so this is now 2016 so at this point three years later he's still he's still in relations with this woman um I feel like 2016, 2017, 2017 was the worst beating he's ever given me. Um, and I'm just, at this point, I'm free of it. So I'm just gonna just, I'm gonna tell y'all. Um, we went to a friend's birthday party and we were pregnant. We were pregnant. We were excited. I was drinking Sprite that night. This baby... I was like, this is the one, this is the one that's going to be viable. Cause let me be honest, you know, with ovulation calculating anxiety within my relationship, trying to pursue being, um, being, being the wife that he felt like I needed to be, or maybe I felt like I needed to be by giving him a child. Um, cause you know, he'd been telling me I wasn't his wife unless I had, had given him a child, like by the law we're married, but like in God's eyes, we're not married. Um, Mind you, he already has three children by three different women. I would have been the fourth. I was his third marriage. And yet I still was trying to please him, even with all of those character flaws, essentially. Um, so we go to a friend's party. I'm excited. We drive separately because he wanted to ride with his homeboy from mili from the military and, and his homeboy's um, girlfriend. What I didn't find out is that the girlfriend brought another friend. So it really appeared like they were on a double date. So I arrived to the party with my best friend. You all know Natalie. And, you know, we're side-eyeing it, but, like, also keeping it pushing. Because we're when we get into the party, we're enjoying each other. We're dancing with one another. I didn't know that he had already had quite a bit of cocktails at night. Um, but we had a good time when the party was over, um, I leave to take Natalie home in my car and I'm like, all right, babe, get in the car. We live together. Like, why would you be driving back with your friend? He was like, well, I don't want so-and-so to drive all the way back home by himself. So I'm like, okay. Right. And, um, so I'm, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> like, it's logical, right? I get home by like 1.30 in the morning, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. And um, what happened? Um, God, I'm missing so many things. But uh, prior to that, this particular birthday party that we were going to, we went to annually. And the year before, um, he got into an altercation with my best friend, verbal altercation with my best friend, and her husband and wanted to fight him and because I remained silent in the back seat um he felt like I did not support him so once we were driving home from that same party um he was why do you wear those wigs you look like a fucking clown it, it you know fuck you and your kids he grabbed the car steering wheel and said I'm gonna die you're gonna die with me mind you my children are in the back seat Reese is of age y'all and later I found out that he said, mom, I just closed my eyes and hoped that I didn't die that day. And, um, I was causing, I mean, I wasn't causing, but I, <sighs> my children, you know, my kids, my kids heard that, you know, and I love my boy so much. And I just like, why didn't I just leave? Like, why didn't I just leave? You know, like, and I knew that if I engaged in the conversation, 
I am really doing good, you guys. I, um... I knew, I knew that if, if I engaged in the conversation, he could have killed us. He could have killed us on that highway. And it would have been my fault. It would have been my fault that my babies didn't live a long life, essentially. Right? No, mind you, I never told anybody. I never told anyone what we've been through. I had one friend, Peter, who I told, who I alluded to some of the behavior because one night, the night that he flipped that chair on me, Reese was staying, I mean chair, the bed on top of me, Pierce was sleeping in the living room and Reese was at a friend's house and he kicked us out. He kicked me and Pierce out. I ran out the house barefoot with my son. I stayed at a red roof inn. And then I moved in with my friend Peter for a week with my children. I did. I did. Um, so this particular birthday, I just felt like every year it's been some shit. But this is different because I'm pregnant. But it wasn't. It was the worst. It was the worst ever. Um, he didn't come home. And he had done this before. He did not come home until 5 o'clock in the morning after we left that party at around 1 a.m. I don't know what he did with that girl. I can only imagine. Um, but when he came home, he tried to cuddle up with me. And, I mean, you're married. You know, when your man does some shit to you, you don't want to be... We ain't, we ain't booed up. So I relocated to the living room with a robe on, but I was naked underneath of it. Like I said, Reese was gone. Pierce had, was downstairs in bed, you know, once I relieved the babysitter. And I went to get up to, like, I probably need, well, no. What ended up happening was I was laying in bed, and I had my robe on, and I was naked. And I went to stand up, and he grabbed my robe and stripped me, right? So I grabbed the blanket on the bed and wrapped myself because I was like, well, Reese is going to be coming home in the morning. I can't be naked on the couch in the living room. So I went to go back in the bedroom to get clothes and he had locked me out of the master bedroom. So at this point I'm on level 10, mind you, I'm pregnant. And I kicked the door down, y'all. I kicked a hole in the door, reached my hand through the door, unlocked the door. Grabbed me some clothes. He's saying things, he's popping off. I come back and I I come, I grab my computer, I grab my cell phone, and I come and sit back on the couch. Because at this point, I'm like, where the fuck am I going to live? I got to go. I got to, I got to go. I didn't call any family members. I just tried to manage this on my own. Um, and you would think after this situation that I was, I would have left then. I didn't. I didn't. So we're four years into this relationship, and... This happens. He knows I'm pregnant. He comes, he storms out of the room because I've triggered something when I bust the door down. Essentially, I bust a hole in the door to get into the master bedroom. And he gets this close to my face and he said, I will fucking kill you and Pierce. Um, and I believed him because he threatened to kill me before. So I called 911. And when I called 911, I don't know if it was, I don't know. I, I mean, I believed him. You know, he had told me what he did in the military. He had told me the things that he'd experienced and that he's done. I thought he would kill me. I thought he would kill my son. So in calling 911, I'm screaming, please help me, come get me. I'm shouting my address. He's threatening to kill my son and myself. And he grabs my cell phone and hangs up on the police. We live in a very white town <laughs> and I hate to say white, but it was, uh, it wasn't middle class. We lived in a prestigious neighborhood and the police wasn't going to play. And, and I hate that underserved neighborhoods are a little bit more delayed in these type of responses, but 
I knew what I was doing by calling 911. I knew that I would get immediate help. So I'm, he's fighting with my phone. He's taking my cell phone. We're fighting it like this. And you know how, like when you hold the iPhone a certain way, like an emergency dials out to, to like first responders. So they sent someone. But in the midst of me fighting over my phone and trying to ex run out the house, but also thinking Pierce is downstairs so I can't leave the house, he's he's literally um, beating me up. He's punching me in the face. He's kicking me in my stomach. He's choking me and I thought I was going to die. I remember looking up at him and saying, it's me, it's me. Why are you doing this to me? Um slammed me up against the wall, dragged me across the living room floor. Mind you, Pierce is downstairs. I assume he's sleeping. I don't know. He was only... He was only five? Um, yeah, he was... No, I'm, no, no, no. He was six, maybe? I, I don't... Maybe? And, um... Yeah, the police came. And... Uh, my ex was fairer than me, so he has some scratches in his under eye. And he threw me in the shower. Get in the shower. I had a weave in my hair. He had pulled the weave, so I am bald in certain areas of my, my head to this day. And probably why I'm so obsessed with wigs because of the insecurity. The police come, and he throws me in the shower. So then I hear someone knock on the door. Ma'am, can we come in? I said, yes, can I get dressed? Um... Well, we're going to let your husband come in and help you get whatever. I don't know why they did that, but no, 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 because no, he was sitting on the couch. So the police knocked on the door. I said, well, let me get dressed. And at the time he told me I had to put a cap on, right? Um, later I found out he was doing that because I had black eyes. And um, I may be dark skinned, but bruises happen. So cop is asking me, did your husband put his hands on you? I'm denying it. I'm saying, no, we just got an altercation. He's drunk. He doesn't really, he's not really conscious of what's going on. Like, you know, I'm, I'm covering for him. Police ask him if I was physically assaulting him. And he said, yes. He said, she gets wild sometimes. And she was not happy with me. And because in the state of Washington, if there's physical if there's physical, um, what is it called? If they can see that there's a scar or scratch on you, it could be a scratch. They can arrest you. So he lied. They saw a, a scratch, a defense scratch, a scratch. <laughs> um, and they locked me up, y'all. They locked me up. Um, and the most horrifying part of it is that I was born and raised in Baltimore and had never been in trouble in my life. And for the first time in 35 years, I had handcuffs. I had handcuffs on me. And he allowed it. Not only has he broken me and tried to ruin me, I was now being sent off to jail for loving a monster. Um, needless to say, uh, the judge let me out because she saw me and she said, you don't belong here. You're not like these other women. You're not... You're not supposed to be here. And, um, 
he showed up in court. And they allowed him to pick me up and take me home. And all the charges were dropped, but I had to go to domestic violence victims classes. I was on probation for a year. And this man beat me and violated me and terrorized and tortured me. So that's rich, right? Like, I... <laughs> I ended up having to go to a domestic violence victims because I was considered the abuser. So, needless to say, I lost that baby while we were visiting his parents in another state across the country. And I had to be rushed to the ER. Because I was in so much pain. I couldn't manage doing the, the miscarriage at home. So I had to get a DNC in a foreign hospital and a foreign doctor. And you would think that he was there with me. He wasn't. I was by myself. But these tears are not, these tears aren't for what I went through. It's because I'm, I'm alive. I'm alive. My babies are good. And I can sit here and, and tell you that I made it. Like, I made it. I made it. God showed me so many signs and I ignored him over and over and over again. And you would think, you would think after going to jail for two days, <laughs> going through a year of probation and having a black eye and lying to my job. That I got in a car accident. <laughs> I lied to my best friend. I lied to my family. I lied to my kids. I told them I got in a car accident. Whew. So, 2018. Um, we go on a trip to Australia. Right? You guys remember that, right? We're there, we're there all of 72 hours. And I confronted him about something that he told a family member that you know Amber, um, Amber hits me. So I, I brought him I brought him aside and said, Did you tell are you telling your family that I hate you? I never I now mind you, whenever I caught him in a lie, he would get aggressive. Cause he was just so passionate. I said, Did you tell so and so that I that I hate you? I said, Did you did you tell them what you did to me? He didn't tell him that. So I said, I don't know if I had I don't know if I had, <laughs> I don't know where this gumption came from, y'all. I don't know. But I said, well, he, well, he's taking a shower. Let's just wait for him to get out the shower. And when he gets up, we'll talk to him about it. And in doing that, um, ignited his rage. Mind you, we had went and saw the koalas. We went and saw the kangaroos. And... Having a beautiful time. Day three, we're in a million dollar Airbnb, the most amazing place I've ever seen. And he is 
angry with me. You ain't cool. You ain't cool. You trying to come here and start shit with my family. Da, da, da. I said, well, wait, why are y'all even talking about that incident? Why are you making it seem like you were in an abusive relationship? I never put my hands on you once. Except the night that you tried to kill me and I was trying to defend myself. I said it just like this. Like this calm, this direct. And um, it was our night to, to cook. Because every couple was cooking every, every every other night. And he was cooking. He was chopping up some food with a knife. And I said, well, we'll just wait for him to get out of the shower. And we'll just confront. We'll just, let's just have an open dialogue about it. And he picks up the knife. And he's like, you ain't going to say shit. <laughs> I said, oh, he's mad. So at this point, I am being a smart ass, right? He's big mad. So I stood up. And he charged, he charged at me with a knife. And even though at that moment I felt the bravest I've ever felt in my life, I also knew this is my light bulb. If he will attack me in front of his family, then he has no shame. Because before he was just doing physical things and being aggressive with me behind closed doors. But I knew in that moment that his cousin didn't take that knife out of his hand. So let's fast forward. <clears throat> that was 2007. No, no, no. That was 2018. His family. I'm not going to allude to which family member. His family helped me escape. They helped me find a hostel in Australia to stay the night. Before I took a ferry back to the town that we stayed in. Um, I called the airlines and I changed my flight. So after flying 17 hours to Australia, I turned right back around and flew back to the States. So that night that I was in the hostel, I called three people. I called my best friend, Abby. I called my sister and I called my mother and I had to tell her each one of these women who means so much to me. What's been going on for the past six years. So that was very hard. Listening to my mother cry. Because someone had a her baby. Listening to her moan. Because she someone had violated me and her grandbabies were exposed and it was just that was listen I cried so much that the woman of the household in this small island in Australia she didn't know me and I don't even know her name but she came in the room with me and stayed with me all night she made sure I drank because I couldn't eat. She she held me. She held me all night. They drove me to where I needed to go to catch the ferry. They bought my ferry ticket to get back to the mainland of Australia. Um... I never saw them again, but I know that God put them there. Cause I was nervous. I mean, it's a hostel. You're 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 millions of miles away from your country. Um, it's not like I was in Sydney, like a main city. You know, I was in a very small little town, and God covered me. My mother had to tell my dad, who was in the states with the boys. My father had flew out to Washington and stayed with the kids, so we could go to Australia. So my mother had to tell my dad, and, I, and it gave him 17 hours to process a man hurting his little girl. Um, my sister flew from Baltimore and met me in Seattle at the same time. I landed at 1230. My sister landed at like 1245. Natalie was 
well on eight months pregnant <laughs> with Miles. <laughs> and in three days, I, Natalie found me another house. I applied for a house. I moved out. And we packed all in three days. Um, his sister held his passport hostage to give me time. I filed a protective order. Um, and when he landed back in the country, I think there was a layover in California. When he landed back in the country, he was issued the protective order. Um, so we get back to the States. Of course, we're still in communication, right? Because um, we were married and I had stopped the direct deposit because I had, I had, um, I was paying the mortgage. Um, he paid a portion of the mortgage. So like if the mortgage was $1,600, I paid a thousand, he paid 600. That's it. <laughs> I paid every bill in the house. Um, and yeah, I was probably behind on some things, but I took care of all of that. And he was working, he had his own business and he was making, later I found out he was bringing home like five grand a month, 4,500 or five grand a month just on um, disability. Never once did he help me with any financial burdens. Um, he had called the bank and let them know that we were separating. So what, I got a phone call from the bank like, oh, now you're in the separation department. So, I mean, he was already doing things to move forward and he would was calling our neighbor like, um, oh my God, my dog, my dog. He never once, my wife, my family, he was worried about Suki. <laughs> and um, never once concerned himself with me. Um, so later I found out that he was not only a narcissist, but a sociopath and, um, and I'm not a doctor. I'm not, I'm not lab. you know, what is it called? I'm not, um, I can't find the words, you guys. <laughs> it's a lot. I am not administering his diagnosis, right? But I later found out his behavior equals this <laughs> and um I want to say uh so I left him October of 2018 the end of October um I, for, I would say October to December the most depressed I lost 36 pounds in three months it wasn't until reset mom I need you to eat I remember that I remember him saying mommy please eat and me and my sister sitting down with him and just asking him, Reese, what do you want to do? Do you want to stay here? Do you want to finish out this year? Because I'm ready to pack it up and move back home. And my sister was like, Amber, if you go back to him. Because I was thinking, oh, we'll just move. We'll take a year apart. We'll do therapy. Our marriage will stay in. I'm st still thinking about being with him, even after all this. Even after the threats of him killing me, driving down the road and taking the steering wheel. Him threatening to kill me and pierce in the house. Him headbutting, choking me, flipping beds on me, all while pregnant. Losing every one of those babies. Later I find out I'm actually very much capable of getting pregnant and and uh, a thriving baby. I thought something was wrong with me. It's just the devil sperm. God wasn't having it. God was not having it. Um... But, yeah, I still was holding on. I was lying to my family and still sneaking off to see him. We were still sleeping together. Um, until January 11th, child, 2019. I was a little tipsy, had a little bit of, you know, you know, I had a little bit of uh, liquid courage. And uh, I still was using the keys. To the house because that was my house too. And girl, while I walk in the house, I look down. I see small sneakers. Now, mind you, his daughter is only six. So, this was an adult woman. A small adult woman. Uh, oh. So, I cut the corner. And he's looking. He's like, Amber, what are you doing? He's zipping up his pants. I see a bitch run across my bedroom. Run into our master bathroom and lock herself in the bathroom. And I'm not going to say it was my proudest moment, but I completely activated Ambra from East Baltimore. And I 
fucked some shit up. I'm not going to sit here and lie to y'all. I'm, I'm, I am, I am well-mannered. I'm educated. I am, I was raised by amazing people, but this don't make these people who fight less than, I'm just saying, like, I went enraged. You are still sleeping with me. You are still telling me you want this marriage. You are still telling me you'll go to therapy. And you sleeping with another bitch in my bed. In my bed. Because it was my bed. <laughs> we got a new headboard and base and everything. But that was my bed. Um, so after I tried to kill her, I had to redirect to fucking him up. Um, I broke nails. Um... Yeah, I wished him nothing but the worst. Um, I told him he'll die alone. And that I don't need to do anything to you because God got me. I don't know. Um, I don't know why I was still holding on. Even after everything. he, Even after a black eye. I don't know if you guys remember me taking a, a significant break um, in 2017. And was only doing hair videos because I didn't want y'all to see my face. I didn't want y'all to see the dark, the darkness. It took about eight months and some heavy coverage of makeup. <laughs> my pupils were bloodshot. So, excuse me, my mentor gave me the money to file for the divorce. And he was served... Uh, 48 hours after I filed in all of 2019 he tortured me he created Instagram accounts to follow me he tried to get in touch with me by so many ways until he started emailing um, when I went to Thailand that was my eat pray love my mother said I needed to go and get myself together he emailed me the day I landed um, then I learned how after June, oh, so I went to Thailand, he sent me an email, I'm talking to my girlfriends, they're walking me through it. I never ever spoke to him or saw him again from January 11th, 2019 to this present day. I never called, I never text. Um, that night, uh, a, a girlfriend, we're not friends anymore, <laughs> but that a girlfriend talked to me until five o'clock in the morning because I had a panic attack in my driveway seeing him be with another woman and then protecting her telling her you're not my wife anymore we're, we're very much married we were only separated three months <laughs> we were still sleeping together and he's like I never slept with you so then I had to like bust out receipts like we're doing this we're doing this at 36 years old so, I filed. 2019 was extremely difficult. Um, I shaved my head bald in June. He emailed me. Very manipulative email. Um, I've always found you to be beautiful. You never needed those wigs. I'm so happy to see you thriving and the boys getting big. Because he's, he's surveillancing me on Instagram at this point. Um, through accounts that I can't. I mean, I have over 36,000. At the time, I had almost 38,000. I've lost quite a bit because I haven't been as active. But I can't identify who what accounts he's using. He started following my friends. So I had to let my friends know these were his accounts. I remember when me and Stephanie went to Canada because I was so severely depressed. I couldn't even get it together. Um... It was just the worst year of my life, but also the best. You know, that was the year me and my sister went to Europe for a month. Um, I ended up losing my job in March of 2019 because um, the protective order included her building and she was scared that he was going to come and shoot up the place, essentially. Um, so I lost my job, but I didn't go right back to work because I wanted to be home and available for the kids. Um, so my divorce was final December 4th of 2019. My sister and my cousin and my mentor um, went to court with me. He attempted to talk to me that entire time and I ignored him as if he didn't exist. He was extremely disrespectful to the judge. 
um, and I felt the judge realized what I was dealing with um, and awarded me the things that I got. And the sad part of all of this is that he was married to two other women before me and he abused them both. I do feel like his second wife got it worse. Um, but I always say this, like it doesn't, you can, you can experience physical abuse, but it's really the mental that sticks with you. It's the, it's the scars you don't see. So fast forward two years. Um, I am in the most amazing relationship. He's a beautiful man. And he saw right through me. I avoided him. I actually curved him. And he came back for me. And he's a God-fearing man. He is my best friend. He is a man of conviction. And he's texting me right now. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, how you doing? <laughs> he doesn't even know that I'm filming this, but he's like, how's your day going? How you feeling physically, mentally, spiritually? Like, he's just really dope. Um, he is stubborn. <laughs> he's a Taurus. But, um, you know, not to say that he didn't have his, his path to getting to this relationship, but I did the work. I'm still doing the work. Um, there are things in my relationship that we experience um, that is still some residual leftovers from my previous relationship. Trust, reassurance, honest, being honest and truthful, being transparent. So we still face things, but it's it's because he recognizes those things makes it such a safe space to just be Amber. And it's funny because last night he says, um, Amber, you're free. And what frustrates me is that you don't know that you're free. So, um, the boys are happy. The boys are thriving. We're taking our time. So the kids haven't met him yet. They know of him, but they haven't met him yet. And I'm in the healthiest place I could ever be. And yes, I had to start over. Yes, I live in the basement of my sister's house with my kids and my dog, <laughs> but I'm alive and I'm truly better than ever. So I hope that gives you some perspective. I hope that gives you strength when you don't think you have it. I hope that it gives you hope when you don't think there's none. And... I hope that I am, I hope that you just see that I'm just like you. I just put a smile on for so long and now the smile you see is happy, healthy, thriving, <laughs> and love the way that I deserve to be loved. So, until our next video, I shine bright. <laughs>